The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Welcome to it Wednesdays here at Hale Bar City. We're powered by Cornhead Lager, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Hope you do it all right. Hope you had a party at PBA. If you went, if you watched, if you listened, and uh, Nebraska back to their winning ways. That's a couple in a row as they embark on, well, a, a treacherous stretch, but doable stretch. Plenty of Nebraska basketball to get into. We'll dive into some Husker football recruiting as Nebraska eyeing the quarterback beyond this uh, next season. And uh, we'll talk with Evan Bland about that. Uh, Mike Babcock is already in the green room. You say Babbers and poof, he appears. So we'll talk with Mike Babcock here in about 15 minutes. And then a jock doc to wind us down. Plenty of room for you at 489-1240, 489-1240 or 800-825-1240. 5865 can email the show chris at hail varsity.com different ways to watch and listen of course the hail varsity radio network hail varsity youtube can watch the show that way we have added our friends at 590 on the twitter feed so can uh, check out 590 espn omaha their twitter handle kfor's twitter handle as well and then facebook as well on uh, KFOR, the Hale Varsity Radio Twitter feed. So there's three Twitter options for you, at H Varsity Radio. Give all a follow. Well, what'd you think? You and I don't have to do a nasty, vicious shot out of a Texas Longhorn coffee cup. I thought you picked that Ohio State would cover. Well, we, we, I picked the Nebraska win. Okay. Or did you bring any? Did you bring any poison to put in the glass? I'm sure I have some later on somewhere in here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just just got. He's got empties. He's got half empties. I'll have to do it during a break so you can't find my secret stash. That's in your drawer. I know where it's at. I don't even think I have a, a stash. No, actually. No. Uh, so Nebraska won. That's big. It didn't look like it early. The story, couple different storylines. One, of course, the Dutchman. Uh, Rink Mast was incredible, went off 34 and 10, uh, six of eight from three point land. Probably, you could argue, one of the best performances in PBA. When we think back to, to all time performances, I always go back to Harold Minor, baby Jordan, going for 40 plus against Danny D in Nebraska. I saw that. That was 92, I think. But Rink. Rink was incredible, and he did it all. He's always been tough. He's been physical, and now he's feeling better. I think that's a big part of it. Uh, We'll get a little bit more into Nebraska, but C.J. Wiltshire has been big, and he showed up huge. And quite honestly, I I, got to stop and applaud. We'll get to the crop report here in a minute. But I got to applaud Fred Hoiberg. Not just because, hey, they've won a couple. Not just because they're 15-5, and five, the best start since 1991, a historic three-seed season. But how many guys have the guts as a coach in today's era of college basketball to take one of their streakiest players off the court for an extended period of time? Mm. And not only replace him with a walk-on but replace him with a walk-on that's your son. That's all sorts of dicey. And what wasn't happening? Um, well, <laughs> Kise was getting beat up, plain and simple, on the defensive end. And there was really no answer. And you have Ohio State and what they were able to do the first 10 minutes of the game. I mean, Elijah, I was listening to that last night, dude. And Nebraska was was a mess. Ohio State was getting anything they wanted. Thornton was big time. Scored 10 points, had several assists. And you, you come in, you say, all right, Sam, you're on him. 
Sam Hoiberg comes in, and we've seen Sam Hoiberg help flip that switch for Nebraska basketball because of his selflessness, but because of his energy, his intensity, his physicality, his defense helped ignite things, dove on the floor. That meant Nebraska woke up and then stepped to the spotlight rink for a couple of back-to-back threes right around under that five-minute mark. Nebraska never looked back. And then Wiltshire, the exclamation point, he comes in, second half, gives him more breathing room. Northwestern, you you weren't able to, to get comfortable. Nebraska has shown the ability to get comfortable more times than not. They eventually explode on somebody at PBA. They did that last night as they were up by as many as 18 points. So, uh, gutty win for Nebraska, and uh, they kind of snapped out of it. Uh, and Ohio State faded, but a lot of that, to me, was because Nebraska had something to do with it. All the right buttons were pushed. Rink response game. CJ keeps on keeping on. And then, of course, the defensive effort by Sam. Look, Tominaga is going to be okay. You're going to need him, obviously, offensively. But I, I was listening to, to Kent and Jake and... I'll get into the Peacock story in a little bit. <laughs> but, I mean, you're in a tight game where you're trading baskets. And there was just a, a little bit of frustration with Kisei not getting any touches. And what's he do? He launches a stupid shot. It's a stupid shot because it doesn't go in. Hmm. I mean, he was hunting his shot and, oh, I haven't touched the ball. I need to catch it and shoot it. There, there's a little bit of that, that that goes on with him. And if he's making them and it's hot, great. But in some of their losses, not just him, but he has been a part of it where he's making a tough decision on offense that uh, doesn't help the situation. And uh, that's just kind of the, the give and the take I think you have to have with, with Kisei in that. Well, but you know good, what? Good, if, if, good for having him sit. Oh, yeah. And, and and getting the results you need defensively to turn the game. Because, like I mean, with, with Kise, he'll knock down one of those crazy shots you don't think is going to go in, and you know the next four are going to go down. Or he'll hit the, the, type of he'll hit the dagger is. against Northwestern. He'll hit the dagger. He's the guy you have to have on the floor at times this season, but last night was not a game where you needed him on the floor because of, as you said, what you were getting from CJ and what you were getting from Rink, especially from behind the arc. I mean, Connor Clark was so close with his C.J. Wiltshire X-Factor. Mm-hmm. And you could still make an argument that if C.J. doesn't knock down, I think it was, was it back-to-back shots back in to the back first threes, half? Back-to-back comes in and pushes that lead back up to nine. Yep, yep, hits the, the, the well, you're talking second half. I'm talking yes. first half whenever Nebraska is down by 10 early in that. C.J. comes off the bench, and what does he do? He knocks down his first two shots, a mid-range jumper, and then a three-pointer, gets PBA right back into it. and The, and, the, and the juice. Sparked yeah. the offense. I think maybe gave Rink a little bit of confidence to start knocking down a couple of threes. And then once the juice is behind that Nebraska team, it really didn't matter from that point on. The student section, I think, was a big factor last night in terms of the life that was behind that Nebraska basketball team and the momentum getting away from Ohio State multiple times in that game. The uh, The student section really willed that team. And, and Rink, to his credit, was great, but... I think if he goes and has a pedestrian type night, Nebraska still goes and wins that game. This type of all-out effort you had from the five guys that were on the floor for most of that second half, defensively on the boards. I mean, our concern last night was that uh, Ohio State without physical Nebraska. Nebraska, what do they do? They go out rebound Ohio State by seven, get them by three on the offensive glass. Thirty-five total uh, rebounds for Nebraska in the game last night. They went out physical to Ohio State. And that was a credit to to the fans, I think, pushing that team on. And the five guys you had on the floor for most of that second half with C.J. Bryce Williams, Jamarcus Lawrence, Rink Mastin, and Josiah Alec, those five put in really, really good work defensively on the glass physically. And you know what? You get uh, an exclamation point on top of it with Rink Mast knocking down all his shots and, and 34 total points for Rink Mast. Like, uh... A lot of positives be, to be taken away from last night, and it wasn't just Rink. Rink's going to steal the the show. He's going to steal the, the the fans' attention on a day like today following that performance. But there was so much more that went into that win last night than just Rink Mast. Well, it was, a, it was a breakout, and he's just another weapon you have. I mean, you he had come in averaging six a game with a boatload of turnovers, shooting, I don't know, 20%. I mean, he was, he was off. Now, he didn't let it get his his hustle or his grit down. He still fought against Rutgers. He still fought against Northwestern. But he was able to, to kind of show his full repertoire uh, against Ohio State. Let's get you the roll call here. 
as we do our starting five. First five members of Hale Varsity's Stream Fan Club. That sounded wrong. Uh, in the stream here, we'll give you a name shout out. Andrew checks in along with Anthony. Uh, they tie. We do not have a photo finish, finish here. Uh, Jeff Snitley in at third. Patrick checks in at four. Brandon, five. And uh, as we roll forward, Alan, a uh, new name in here. Uh, Alan, welcome. Eric checks in. Roger says hello. Jeff and Weston also. So thank you much. Anonymous also comes in. You're able to communicate with us via the stream, Hail Varsity YouTube channel or Twitter at H Varsity Radio. So those are some observations last night. Let us get into kind of the latest from Nebraska from a crop report. Net rankings, Nebraska's already all the way up to 46. They continue to climb. I don't have Ken Palm. Do you have Ken Palm? Net, well, net like, ranking seems to be the one that's become fashionable in recent sure. years, though. Kim Palm's still there, but net ranking is the one that's at the top of the list in terms of metrics. What I've got right now uh, from Lenardi is this. Your, your first four out, Gonzaga, Providence, Colorado, Wake Forest. Your next four out, Indiana State, Nevada, Texas, and the University of Florida. The last team out is Gonzaga. They have made the tournament for 24 straight years, I believe. The last team in, the Fighting Danas of Oregon. (laughs) And right now with Bracketology, Nebraska is an eight seed. No, nine. Nine seed. Against Seton Hall. Out in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, your next four for Nebraska. Elijah, would you agree? Pretty vital. Can we fast forward here and split? Does Nebraska need to split with Maryland, with Wisconsin, with Illinois, with Northwestern? That's a big ask. As much as it pains me to say, one in three. Just get one, but the one's got to be Wisconsin? No, it doesn't have to be Wisconsin, because if you get one, it either means you got Wisconsin at home or you got a road victory. Either way, that's a win. That might be too downer on this Nebraska basketball team because I think they're really good, but either way, you'd be getting a major win, either a home win against a top 25, a quad one victory, or you're going on the road and getting a victory and kind of getting over that hump, beating the boogie monster, if you will, in terms of the, the road victory. So I think even one in three could be seen as a win for this Nebraska basketball team, as disappointing as it feel for the fans and as disappointing as uh, we'd probably be here talking about it on the show. One in three, I'll lay it out now. How do you look? Would not be a horrible, horrible outcome over the next four games. How, how do you look against Maryland on Saturday? Tough road environment, doable road environment, and I – but I just I have zero faith. I have zero faith they go win at Maryland. I think Wisconsin they'll give Wisconsin all the hell they want. Wisconsin's just really really good. Mm-hmm. I think you could make an argument Nebraska is going to jump their seeding if they get Wisconsin as well because you have a win over over a one seed in Purdue. You would have a win over a two seed in uh, the Wisconsin Badgers. So. The way things shake out right now, you have Kansas State is one of the four teams, the last four in. Uh, You have um, South Carolina that's in there. They had a big win at home. They blew out Kentucky, kind of similar to what Nebraska did. And as you break it down with the Big Ten, uh, you're just going to get six teams in right now. That's Purdue a one seed. That's Wisconsin a two seed. Illinois is currently a three. Nebraska a nine. They have Michigan State in, which I don't disagree with, but they have Michigan State as a seven seed. And their strength to schedule Northwestern's in. Michigan State, according to Ken Palm, is number 17. I have Ken Palm pulled up. Nebraska's 45. Okay. Michigan State's 17. Northwestern's 10. So you have some margin for error if you're Nebraska and you, you can't step on yourself at home uh, against some of these teams you've already beaten or the get-even games, right? The Rutgers and the Minnesotas that loom. 
but go go get me one, maybe two in your next four. Get a road win and beat Wisconsin at home. I think you're you're feeling great about February. Can you power rank the importance of the next four, if you will? Like yeah. One being most important. Because I look at that home game against Wisconsin. Wisconsin. It's, it's attainable because you're at home. And then you get him back after losing on the road. So I think that's pretty important. Illinois seems like the hardest game among this four. They just sure. lost at home to Maryland, though. But are they going to lose at home again? I don't know. Nebraska's played Illinois pretty well. So we'll get, I think the most important one, I think the biggest wow win would be Illinois on the road because yep. it's a top 10 road win. But I think Wisconsin's more important. I think so because of the seating and the yep. projection. So give me Wisconsin. I think to get off the schneid and keep this streak going, go get me Sunday or go get, go get me Saturday at Maryland mm. is my, my is my power ranking second. So Wisconsin one, get me Maryland two. Uh, for fun, let's throw in Illinois. <laughs> Northwestern's really good at home. They beat about everybody. Yeah, uh, at least the last year or so. If, if I'm going based on wow. I think Maryland's probably at the bottom of the list, but it, it might be the highest in terms of importance because of getting something rolling and getting you go uh, get, getting North- some 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 feel good going into a tough four game. You know stretch. what? You you go get one at Northwestern. I mean that's that's a road tournament win. They're they're in right now as a ten seed. We'll get Babber's thoughts on the Dutchman's performance. Uh, talk some football with Mike as it is winter conditioning time, and uh, his take on. Just where he thinks Nebraska basketball is at. We'll hear from Fred Hoiberg this hour as well. Uh, we get the lowdown from Jason Kelsey on why he was showing his nipples. Hail Varsity continues. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. And now. And now, back to Hail Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time. Find the podcast, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play with Hail Varsity. And the Hale Varsity YouTube channel. Watch us on different Twitter platforms as well. Mike Babcock with us from Hale Varsity at Herd Ad Sports. Can send your subscription request to Mike. He'll get you a bi weekly letter, historical and topical, with uh, Herd Ad Sports at Mike B at Herd Ad Sports.com. Babbers, were you at PBA last night? Did you watch? Did you listen? Uh, how'd you consume? I watched on the Peacock. Okay. Um, At the arena. I needed to call you to invite myself over because... You should have. I should have contacted you. Mama has it, and I reset my Wi-Fi three times, and the app just, like, blinked at me. So apparently I needed to delete the app and then reload the app and of course she couldn't remember the password anyway so it's not her fault i should have just gone to the bar mike i should have just gone yeah. to the bar elijah and and been okay that way I, well, I had no issue streaming the game <laughs> yeah because you're from south africa apparently if it works it works uh-huh. well i just got to need a new phone in the week but it uh, it's pretty good what'd you think last night in nebraska I, you know, I, I thought it was a, a great effort. I, I think, you know, your mention of guys coming off the bench, Wilcher, um, Sam Hoiberg. And, I, you know, I think the last couple of games we've seen it too with Josiah Alec, mm-hmm. he brings a great energy off the bench. And that's, you know, in this case, they needed him to, to start, I think, because, uh, Gary, because of Gary's injury. Um, and, uh, you know, you've got to – You've got a situation where you bring this energy in from these guys, Wilcher and and uh, uh, Alec and and uh, Sam Hoiberg. I, I just think it gives the Nebraska the kind of spark that uh, you don't look at it just as a five man game. Uh, it's more than that, and that's what Nebraska has done. Now the concern is we see this at home, but then we don't see it on the road necessarily as much. And three of the next four games, as you pointed out, are on the road. So what happens at that point? I think of is, is it six of the last 11 games are on the road. Okay, so if Nebraska holds court at home, uh, which would mean winning against Wisconsin, which would be a big win, um, then what can you do with those six road games? Uh, can, what, you know, how many of those can you win? Can you win some of those? I mean, do you 
does it become the different team when Nebraska goes on the road again, uh, like we saw specifically at Rutgers and the blowout loss at Iowa? Um, or is it something that uh, uh, they build the energy from the home wins and can get something done on the road? Um, that's To me, that's the big question. It's what happens on the road. Because we've seen Nebraska at home. We've seen what Nebraska can do at home. Only lost once at home. That was an embarrassing loss to Creighton, but that was a while ago. Um, so what can they get done on the road? Can they... You know, can they beat Maryland? Can they win at Illinois? Any chance at Northwestern? You mentioned Northwestern pretty rough at home. Um, and then down the line, uh, what, they have to go to uh, Ohio State? Michigan, I think, is one of the road games. Um, They're at Illinois. At Illinois, yeah. Uh, Northwestern, That those two are coming up. Um I can't remember what the other one. And then Minnesota comes to, to Lincoln, so they um, they end with they end with um, with Rutgers. So there's Rutgers, couple, yeah, Rutgers they, in Lincoln. They're at so. Indiana. They they got to go to Hoosier. Yeah, there you go. So that's my question: is what happens on the road? Because I think that we've seen what Nebraska is capable of at home with the energy of the players and the and you know now the students are back. Um, the energy at uh, Pinnacle Bank Arena, um, but what happens when they go on the road? I, I was just uh, dumbfounded by the by the Rutgers loss. I never thought the Huskers were going to lose that game. Yeah, Mike, it's it's weird. It almost feels like it's a completely different basketball team when it goes on the road, and that that's the case for a lot of teams in the Big Ten. But Nebraska seems to take it to another level in terms of the, the home and road splits. Obviously, going on the road is tough for any team, but Nebraska makes it look so much more difficult when they go on the road. Can you explain that? Is it as simple as Pinnacle Bank Arena? Is that tough of a place for road teams to come in and play? Have you heard reports of Nebraska tightening their rims differently than the other gyms in the Big Ten? Well, what's the difference whenever Nebraska goes on the road based on what you've seen? Yeah, well, that's a great question, and I have no answer because if I did have an answer, I think I'd uh, contact Fred Hoiberg. I think you'd say, be the head coach. <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's something that uh, needs to be taken care of. You know, I, I'm sure that they, the coaches have some idea of what happens, and they're trying to work on it. But, you know, I don't see it. I just see it's like a different team gets on the plane when they take off for – for these other places and uh you know it's just a head scratcher uh to me you know maybe if you could okay maybe the huskers go to maryland and get a win you know win at maryland somehow you figure it out and get a win there uh, maybe that changes your perspective because it convinces you that hey we can get it done we can get the job done on the road um what do you got one one road win so far. Yeah, and it's against a as we talk tournament team. It's against K State, yeah. and you and you throttled them. You killed them. But you should have two more. You should have Rutgers, and you should have Minnesota. Here's what happened, yes. right? And and it comes down to maturity. It comes down to response, and it comes down to toughness, right? They they were aggressive and outworked Kansas State. Specific, specifically Jawan with the 18 rebounds. K-State wanted none of that hustle, right? And credit to Nebraska. It wasn't a great offensive day, but it was enough, right? They put up enough, put up enough offensive points and, and got great defense and rebounding. They won that. Nebraska had, had Rutgers. They had Minnesota. They even battled all the way back from Iowa. And what Nebraska needs to eliminate or limit when they're on the road, fellas, is these settle moments. They settle for some stupid shots. They don't play with the same intensity defensively. They allowed themselves to get punched in the face and have their lunch money taken physically. I'm not saying rink, but everybody else did against Rutgers. And, and, and there's, a, there's a moment where they slip into the let me whine and look for a call. They get rid of that. They can go win some of these road games. They got to be tired of leaving it up to somebody else on their team or wearing a striped shirt with a whistle to 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 make a 
call for them or to, to, to go execute something. So I think they're, I don't think it's a mental thing. I don't think they need couch time and to do therapy. I think it just kind of comes down to them being finally sick of experiencing, um, uh, you know, a, a letdown loss. They, they've had their moments. You're not going to be perfect in the Big Ten on the road, but man, they uh, they've really let a couple slip away. They got to be angry about that, I would think. Yeah, that's true. But in, you know, you mentioned the Minnesota game as one they should have won, but they were coming off that loss to Creighton. I think their heads were still spinning there. That, well, they were that, up like that, what, fifteen and a half? They were killing them. Yeah. 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 I mean, how does it? How do these things happen? Mm. Uh, it's, it's a new night it's, every night, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, fifteen and five start with eleven games to go. If if they just won all the home games and lost all the road games, they're what twenty and eleven, and I think they're better than that. Yeah. So, the, the, how? Let me ask you. Let me ask the old Isaiah Roby question. Does Nebraska now know, know, know how good they really are? What well, do you like, think? When you talk about how good they really are, this seems to me to be the best Husker basketball team of my lifetime. They just can't seem to put it together on a night-to-night basis. Whenever they're clicking, which tends to be at home, I don't think I've ever seen a better Husker basketball team. That's fair. In, in my lifetime. You should, to be noted, I the, the Husker basketball I remember is 2005 until present. 2017. I think this team beats them. 2017, 2018 was pretty good. They got hosed. I think about the the fourteen fifteen. That to me is the best I've seen with with them and Petaway. But they were still streaky back then too. Yeah, but they won on the road. They won at top five Michigan State. They won. They beat no. They beat uh, Final Four Wisconsin. Mike. So those are two of the most impressive wins in a month. Their final nine games, and it's. They, I think they were good, but they were they got way hotter. Then they were good. I mean, that makes sense. If, if you think about it, though, Nebraska has a win that's just as good as that Wisconsin win against Purdue at home. Not as as in big a, or not as big a moment mm-hmm. being the last game of the season, but now you just need to go get a road win that matches Michigan State, and I think you have a resume that matches that year as well. Mike, where would you see this Nebraska team? Um, in, in in recent years, I think it has the potential, but we still got those eleven games. It has the potential to be the best one I've seen in in mm-hmm. some time. Um, but again, we got 11 games left to play and what's going to happen in those 11 games, you know, if the potential is there, what I see is there, um, but can they stay healthy enough and can they get the job done down the stretch and win some road games and hold, hold court at home? Um, and, and can they, then they have that potential? And can they limit those frustrating moments? Because while this might be the best team I've seen, it's also, bar none, They're the most maddening. frustrating team. They are maddening, they are maddening at times. Mike, real quick, uh, thoughts on, on just what's going on with football now, winter conditioning, the importance? Uh, well, you know, we got, uh, what, half a dozen guys in the transfer portal that are already reported and are involved in it. You got uh, Dylan Royella is already here. He's involved in it. Um, I think there's going to be, you know, it, I can't remember an off season that quite had this much energy and expectation and, you know, what's it going to look like in the spring. And I bet the spring game is going to be crazy, <laughs> uh, sell out, you know, kind of a mentality it won't be sold out probably, but a uh, pretty big crowd, but just a lot of energy uh, around that, the program. And I think it's energy that's deserved. <laughs> Uh, but as I always say, let's uh, let's wait and see what happens in the fall before we get too too carried away. We've got uh, we've got noteworthy people in uh, the transfer portal, and the recruiting class, um, joining the guys that are coming back. But let's see what happens. Measured and tempered, I love it. But it's okay to to be a little excited if you're a Nebraska oh, yeah. fan with all the the juice that's going on. Mike Babcock, find him on Twitter with Hale Varsity at MD Babs is where you follow him. Heard at Sports at Mike B at HerdAtSports.com. Babbers will check in next week. Thanks so much for talking ball. Thanks, guys. There he is, Mike Babcock with us. We'll get to some of your stream comments on the way with Hale Varsity. 
Hail Varsity Radio is live. Now, back to Schmitty. Schmitty's a great guy, but he don't have a brain. And Elijah. You want me to speak? When I point you, yeah. On Hail Varsity Radio. Back with you, it's Hail Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. I love your power ranking question on the road, where you put them. If I'm ranking best Nebraska teams I've seen, I'm going 90-91, Tony Farmer. Obviously, that, that, that team, the three-seed team was just incredible, and they, they, dude, they tuned people up. <laughs> they were great. Uh, the 93-94 team that won the Big 8 tournament, they, they would hit a skid in that part of the season, but they were super talented with a bunch of freshmen that were, I should say, sophomores that were great that went on to win the NIT in, uh, I think, um, it was 95, yeah. And this team's good. The Petaway team was was great. And Tim Miles asked, asked the question, this was after the tournament run. He didn't know if they were that good or they got that hot. I think they were talented, but they got they were scorching hot. And I think 2017, 2018 with Palmer and uh, Cope and company were great. Cope got hurt around this time of year, mm-hmm. derailed them, and then they were left out. And I thought that was an absolute screw job. Uh, with you, you finish top four in the Big Ten, you go to the tournament. No, they had a, a bad Big Ten tournament game. I mean, there, there's some there's some candidates in there because uh, you have 14-15 that made the tourney. That was mm-hmm. a damn good team. You laid out the 17-18 squad. Uh, I go back to, I think it was 07-08 with Alec Marks, uh, March. Sec, Sec mm-hmm. Henry, uh, who else? Dog and Duro was on that team. That, that was a pretty good squad that year. I think that Tud did a, a pretty deep run in the NIT, if I remember correctly. 07, 08. I could, yeah, have, I could have my yeah. ears off just they, like, but I, I know that squad was good. They beat uh, Durant in Texas that year. Mm-hmm. That was big. Uh, the 2010-2011 team. That was, that was Jeter, yeah? Yeah, just missed the uh, the uh, NCAA. They were in the NIT, and they got absolutely annihilated. I never forget that game because you turn on the NIT and Greg Marshall – is just putting it on Nebraska and Doc, and there's old T.O. behind Doc with some donor that probably took a, a you know a jet down to Wichita, and this is what you see in the opening round of the NIT. You're getting beat by 40. Uh, <laughs> there isn't enough booze to sit through one of those beatings. So Anonymous checks in with Nebraska 94 season, uh, five, 15 and 6 start. They finish 18 and 14. Uh, 95, you are 15 and 4. 21 and 14, the NIT. Uh, and then also, you that 95 96 season, they won the NIT. Now, all that said, <laughs> um, that team was too talented. They should have been a eight seed. And you had the infamous walkout. On Danny Knee. Can I can I add though? I know there's some some other ones to get to here with 06. Uh, what's yeah, you, you've had, you've you've been at this spot before, anonymous. I agree with you, but you know, is this is it different? Look at the past four seasons. Can I throw that out there? And I know that's not the perfect way to to quantify this season because it's a different team. But the past four seasons, the the teams that Fred Hoiberg has constructed have been at their best in February. And that's been to a varying level of success. <laughs> but I think it's been pretty incontestable. That they finished the, a year better. That the best that, that Fred Hoiberg's teams have played have been from February 1st on. Mm-hmm. Well, I you know, if, do they have a February surge? That's a great question. Well, but if they have a February surge, you look at the way their schedule wraps up, this could be a team that I understand they have to get over the hump of getting some, some road losses. But if they hit that surge, there's only – four or five games remaining on the, the schedule that I go, yeah, okay, you can probably chalk that up as a loss right now, assuming that there's a, a, a surge. I look at Illinois, I look at Wisconsin, on the road at Indiana, which I'm not even sure I'm going to chalk that up as a loss, on the road at Ohio State, like four games that I look at and go, that's going to be a, a tough pull even if you hit a surge. But, like, you could really finish – if you finish the year sh- strong, I should say, you could really finish the year strong with the way the schedule sets up. The reality is is they they are winless on the road – in the Big Ten, they are one game over 500 in conference play, 
and nothing is a gimme on the road in college basketball. Uh, Nebraska's shown that, but do they go? Do, do they end up with a couple of road wins this season to go with a almost perfect home Big Ten record? It's a big ask either way. And from a margin of error standpoint, Elijah, this team feels like right as we we talk, if we talk right now, they'll they'll rebound and and have an impressive win or two. Or, or figure it out. They're not going to be perfect. They're going to make you scratch your head a few times. But I think they're able to overcome as they move forward if they get better. If they just have a, a, a five minute, a different five minute stretch against these pre, these past losses. If they if they fix that moving forward, they can go get some wins. They're talented enough to do so. They need Juan back. Anonymous says, I just want to be put in a coma. Woke it up when Nebraska either wins a tournament game or preferably up 15 with 30 seconds left. Otherwise, I don't think I can take watching another bubble year. Anonymous does go on to say, though, my own opinion is that we don't fall apart this year and end up with 25 wins and make the Sweet 16. That's lofty. Wow. Saying, but I've been wrong before. There is that PTSD I, th- I think you can that find ten wins you can, with Nebraska. You can find ten wins on the schedule in eleven games. Yes, <whistles> you're good enough to go win ten of the final eleven. Mm-hmm. You're also good enough you have to, to put go it one all together. And, you're good. You're you're also Nebraska where you can go one and ten. You're inconsistent enough. Yes, that especially with a couple of injuries, mm. that would be a, a wheels fall off type scenario. But I think, I don't think they'll fall off. I just they, they just got to do me a favor and and not not be selfish with some shot selection and not be soft in the paint. If they can figure out their road woes, though, and get their road performances closer to their home performances, I think you can look at a, a slate that finishes up with only a loss at Illinois. And I'm being way too lofty. Mm-hmm. I don't think this is actually what happens. But if they get their road performances closer to where their home performances are, I think you can find 10 wins remaining on the schedule. It'll be a tough pull, but... Amazing Daniel checks in. That's what's so frustrating. This team is absolutely good enough to make the tournament. So if they don't, we can legitimately be disappointed slash angry slash sad slash whatever. People will be pissed. Well, if they don't make the tournament, I think Fred's gone, right? I don't think so. With how the year started? I don't think so. I I think an argument, a conversation would be had. Well, sure. But I think Fred has been given... Some patience by Trev. Uh, I think you see it at home for sure. And whether they come back or not, there's a lot of guys on this roster that can come back. So you're you're not absolutely bare cupboard next year. And I'm not already saying move on to next year. It's okay. No, they need to get to the tournament. But I think Fred's people like going to watch Fred's teams. And I don't know that the, and I don't want to get into this because it shouldn't even be within the radar of talking about a coaching change at Nebraska basketball. We're not going down that road because right now the guy's 15 and five and he's, uh, he's a team in the NCAA tournament. Now, Fred's done a hell of a job and he's pushed the right buttons. We kind of laid out the performance he's getting. We'll wind down hour one. We'll talk some Nebraska football recruiting. The Huskers and their staff busy here in 2024. Hale Varsity continues. Evan Bland on the way. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time this hour. It's Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Hope you're doing all right. Uh, coming up, we will check in and uh, say hi to Evan Bland. Recruiting a plenty for Nebraska football as offers are out, coaches on the road, and uh, plenty of uh, winter conditioning ongoing. Reminder about your seatbelt. Be sure to keep both hands on the wheel, eyes focused straight ahead. The driver has one job, that's to drive this message from the NDOT Highway Safety Office. And uh, you have Tim chiming in here on on Fred and his future. And right now, I, I listen. I don't want to go here because I think it's a detractor and it's a distraction. And I know we have a job to do about all things good, bad, and ugly in the world of sports. But it's not even on on the, on the radar for me. 
It's it, it to me it's the big F F they don't make the tournament F the year ends in that way. I think it'd be just a big disappointment with how well their schedule does set up for them. Sure. So I think it should be it's definitely a back burner type conversation. It's definitely not forefront, but mm. I think it is something that should things go horribly, they get to the postseason in the back of your mind. Do they? They get to the postseason. I, I think. I think you stand pat. You need to. And if they if they get hosed and don't get to the tournament, be it injury, be it performance, be it whatever, Fred has flipped the the, the switch here on how he builds his basketball team, and he's done some pretty good evaluation with Portal. And you know, if you can keep some of the high school kids. And keep developing them. Fred's developed guys. If they stay, they played well. I mean, C.J. Wilcher is the best example of that. Absolutely, night and day from what well, you Well, so's, so's Tominaga. Mm. I mean, the last half of the, half of last year and then this year. I mean, even his own son, Sam Hoiberg. Who would, have, who would have thought Sam Hoiberg would have been as key a contributor as he actually has ended up being? It's it's a it's a mentality. You, like, you've got you've got some talent, but it's a mentality. Sam Hoiberg, I do want to give a, a quick shout to him for his defensive performance last night because three years ago, whenever he was a freshman, you thought he was just going to be the feel-good off-the-bench guy, the guy that whenever the games get out of hand and Sam Hoiberg goes up to the scorer's like table, the, the, the student section goes wild. Wow, he's been a, a key contributor. That's a, it's hats off to him because he is not the prototypical Division One basketball player based on frame and based on high school experience. No offense to Pius, but like... That did did not have the the stats in high school or the frame that would lead you to believe he'd be a solid Division One Power Five contributor. So hats off to him for the work he's put in. Well, dude's a Hoiberg; he can ball. <laughs> it, I'm glad they brought him on. Mm. Honestly, it wasn't this um, situation where, well, we're going to bring my kid. No, I mean, he, if he's going to wear a jersey, he's going to do something and contribute, and, and he has. I mean, so he's contributed a hell of a lot more than a lot of scholarship uh, players, a lot of places in the country. He has been arguably uh, a high candidate for MVP for me. I mean, Gary's the barometer. Sam's the heart. He's a spark plug. He is. He is the juice off the bench for sure. This isn't uh, backpats and a hey, uh, let's jump on the bandwagon. We've kind of been consistent with. Our take on Sam Hoiberg all year. We've been consistent with our take on Gary all year. We've been consistent with, you know, how how nice of a weapon Tobinaga is. But if you're not getting the job done defensively, dude, go watch. And you bring in Sam. That was good. And good for Rank, man. He's been through hell and back with that knee and uh, struggling offensively. Great breakout ball game for the Dutchman. Football recruiting, Evan Bland, Hour 2 at Tail Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager. The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Back with you, Tower 2. It's Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbel. Hope you do it all right. You can find us many different ways on the Hale Varsity Radio Network. You can find us on Hale Varsity YouTube. Subscribe to that. Tell a friend. Give us a thumbs up. Some Twitter platforms. The Hale Varsity Radio Twitter feed at HVarsity Radio. Our friends at uh, ESPN Omaha 590 on Twitter. KFOR on Twitter. Facebook. And uh, wherever you uh, just want to check us out and the podcast, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, get that downloaded and uh, give us a rating. Got to answer this before we get to Evan Bland. Dion checks in. So would Nebraska basketball lose on the road to Norfolk Catholic? That depends. Is Kevin Raymaker playing in the in the paint in the paint? Uh, that is someone I don't mess with ever. Uh, we say hi to Evan Bland, Omaha and, World Herald. And as I look at it now, Norfolk Catholic has been good at home this year. Very much. One, eight and six overall. I haven't got a chance to see them this year, but their roster looks somewhat imposing. I think Nebraska could get them, though. We'll see. That's no offense to Norfolk. Evan, what do you think? Nebraska basketball on the road v. Norfolk Catholic. Is it going to be a tough night for the Big Red? 
Maybe that's the thing. Maybe if they can drive, uh, <laughs> maybe that's the difference. Maybe there's like a lack of overhead bin space in their flights or, uh, you know, their ears are popping or they're not popping when they land. I don't know. There's a lot of theories. So maybe we could try the bus theory and, uh, you know, do this experiment the right way. That, that sounds good. We'll get to Evan's basketball thoughts in a moment. But give me a energy rating for the football off season, uh, one out of ten. What's the energy you're kind of feeling from your readers and followers about this Nebraska football off season? Well, for the last six weeks, it's been really high. I mean, with for obvious reasons, with with Dylan Rayola committing, with the uh, transfer portal humming, I think finally it's it, it's starting to to ebb, uh, maybe just a little bit, and. You probably can credit Nebraska basketball for some of that. You can credit uh, just the start of classes at UNL and and the early enrollees are on campus, so they're all behind the scenes with the returning players and uh, going through mat drills and and putting in that work. So, you know, I think the next couple of months will be about as quiet as you could probably expect. Maybe a little bit of um, work action here still before the traditional signing day in a couple of weeks but by and large um you know nebraska's current players are working out their future classes are being recruited with offers going out and um into the 25 cycle and beyond that so still uh you know a lot of excitement maybe it's ratcheted down from like a a nine to a six or a five at this point but, um, yeah, people are absolutely still interested. I'm still interested. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a long two months until we get to spring ball. Well, it's interesting, Evan, because for uh, us, the media and the fans, this is the slow time of year covering Husker football. They're just going and, and working out. They got their early morning mat drills. But you talk to a lot of former coaches and players, and they say, this time right now, January through about May, is when games are won and lost in the fall. It's whenever you're able to, to put in the most work in the weight room. It's where you're able to do the most body transformation. It's where you're able to, to make that development via the weight room and, and via those, those competitive mat drills. Is that not an interesting dichotomy that it's so slow for us, but it's really whenever the team puts their head down and works? Yeah. I mean, you think about just the nature of college football, college athletics now, like with so much – roster turnover that's just inherent in college sports now like that this is that time when it's it's all the things that you talked about with uh, conditioning and technique and and improving your body but it's also that time when guys get to know each other in like a lower pressure environment like there's always you always hear coaches talk about like the bond of shared adversity and there's no way to get to know somebody from halfway across the country than when you're up at 6 a.m. and going through some tough physical challenges or some team competitions in the weight room or whatever it might be. So, yeah, like this is when chemistry happens. This is when those relationships are built. This is when, uh, you know, you build that trust that may show up in a game in October because they were able to, you know, have that interaction, um, you know, now in January. So, like, these are important stretches certainly behind the scenes these are those times when players kind of figure out who those leaders are right you talk about the single digits that they'll vote on in the fall um a lot of that's going to come out of what's coming here in january and through the spring is like who sets the tone who goes above and beyond who uh encourages others brings brings others alongside them like this is when all that stuff comes out so it's a super valuable time and we'll in the media and, and fans will start getting caught up on that uh, progress in a couple of months when they start talking and spring ball starts rolling around, but no doubt about it, there's a lot of work going on now and those games will be seen in the spring and certainly in the fall. Evan Bland with us from the Omaha World Herald Husker football off season at Evan Bland OWH is where you find him on Twitter. So you talk a little bit here, your latest story dives into the quarterback position and Evan, uh, you know, my kid's going to be a senior next year for 2025, uh, and that's... Hey, you're only a couple ways away, a couple years away from being a senior, too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> look, look at that. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to trank Dart Elijah and shave half of his mustache later tonight. <laughs> we'll put that out on Twitter. No, I'm, I'm getting to the quarterbacks. 
um, Evan and uh, Alex Alex Mansky from Algona, Iowa. He's been Nebraska's target. You've got uh, Matt Zollers also from Pennsylvania. And then a name for 2026. This frightens me if I'm uh, an opposing defender because it's Case Vandenbosch knowing how uh, – now, how the mad German used to play in Lincoln in, in Kyle Vandenbosch. Uh, good luck trying to tackle him as a quarterback. Those are three names to watch. Yeah, three of many. Uh, you know, Manskin and Zollers are the 2025s that they have offered right now that are uncommitted. So you would think those, uh, you know, Zollers was just a, a recent one here last week. So that's new to the radar. People that follow recruiting know that Manskin's been in dialogue with Nebraska for a while. He's visited a couple times last fall as well, and, and his recruiting is blowing up. I mean, he's got A&M was a recent offer. A lot of the big Power 5 or Power 4 uh, schools in the Midwest have already come after him. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. Vandenbosch was the one who uh, was a, originally an offer of the old staff, actually under Mickey Joseph at the time, back in 2022. So he was he's one of a handful of the 26s, and then they've even this week offered a, a, a 27 as well. So, like, there's a lot of, uh, you know, offers and, and dialogue and relationship building going on behind the scenes. <clears throat> and really the point of sort of this little snapshot update on quarterback recruiting isn't, necessarily about the individual guys because we know like so much of this is going to change i mean look at just the dylan riola commitment to know like things change things happen you don't really know but what i found more interesting in looking at some of their offers was just what's the type of quarterback that they're looking for where are they going to find them and you know matt rule has spelled it out uh, recently at press conferences he's he said you know they want somebody who who has the ability to extend plays with their feet somebody who has a big enough arm to where they can overcome some of the windy conditions uh, that come with playing in the big 10 and and playing in lincoln and so i think a lot of these guys fit that bill and the farther the further into the future you look with the 26s and the 27s they're offering guys who who are or are becoming national recruits guys getting who are going to be four or five star players down the road and maybe uh, throwing your hat in the ring early can produce something down the line and maybe maybe it doesn't and that's why i think the 25 group uh, sort of illustrates how that process goes along um, you know mansky's someone they've been on like we said but then solar solars is a new offer so i think it's illustrative of the fact that nebraska has a vision for what they are looking for in a quarterback but then also, there's just the reality that you're uh, you're continually evaluating. Guys are continually coming onto the radar, uh, and you're going to have to make offers as other guys come off the board. And as people know who follow recruiting uh, know as well, uh, quarterback recruiting follows a little bit of a different timeline than a lot of the other positions. And so, uh, typically, you know, you're hoping to have your quarterback for your class in the boat by April or May, probably no later than June, so that person can be a a recruiter for the rest of the class. So that's kind of where they are right now. And I just thought it was, it was interesting because everyone's so focused on this new era coming up and rightfully so with Riola and Daniel Kalin and, and Heinrich Harburg still there, but it's just, it's fascinating to see that Nebraska is even looking beyond that to see who that next guy could be in a few years. It's Evan Bland with us here from the Omaha world Herald hail varsity radio and Evan, we're going to get your feel with Kiona Wilhite here in just a second. But while we're talking 2025, who do you think the, the top target is in the class of 2025 as it currently stands? I think there's a, a couple of candidates. I think my mind goes to Christian Jones up at West Side, but any other names that you think could be like a, a top candidate for this class of 2025 from the Husker coaching staff's perspective? Yeah, that'd be the name that comes to mind for me, too. Uh, I mean, he, he just got, a, I think, a, uh, was it Auburn today? Got an SEC offer. Um, so, I mean, he's, he's officially, if he wasn't before, he's officially a national recruit with the SEC coming in and, and like, this is the time. And, and we've, this has been well documented in recent years. Like Omaha um, has become a bigger recruiting hotbed over the last five or six years than it ever was. And, and part of that's because of uh, the development of, of outside academies. Part of that's the quality of the coaching. And then part of that's technology too. And just uh, the accessibility of huddle film and, and the technology that would just say, or make it easier for people in other regions to, to say, hey, yeah, there's a lot of talent in Nebraska and in particular in the Omaha metro area. So, yeah, I, I think uh, Christian Jones is a good example of one. 
Um, you know, there are a number of them in, in Nebraska. And I think it's always a fascinating place to start because you think through the years uh, when Nebraska has been rolling, they've hit the Omaha Metro well. When they haven't been rolling, um, those guys have gone elsewhere or they were under-recruited or unnoticed or whatever. And it does feel like I think they have eight offers out right now to in-state kids in particular um, you know, it's it's something that's clearly been a priority of Matt Rule and his staff. They've had some success, certainly in their last few cycles, keeping those guys in state. But the competition continues to be pretty fierce. And once you're in year two, you start to you start to reach that point to where uh, you can still sell hope, but you're going to have to start selling on field success sooner than later as well. So this is a group I think that you can still sell kind of what's coming, um, but that's going to get harder until that success starts showing itself up on the field. So it's a, it's a big few months, no doubt, for, for Nebraska um, with the in-state guys. But just based on Matt Rule's track record with his staff uh, in his last year, you would think nobody's going to be on these guys um, more than the Huskers. Evan Bland with his Husker football offseason. Let's, let's get your take, your timeline on Keona Wilhite, uh, the edge rusher that was supposed to head to Washington. I know he's visited Sparty. I know he's been to Lincoln. And just another thought, too, Evan, here as we wind down. Nebraska needs to get defensive linemen for 2025 and beyond. That's that's a position of, of need. Do you agree with that? Yeah, it is. And you can tell it's reflected in some of the offers they put out. I mean, they've kicked the tires on uh, junior college prospects. They've, uh, you know, looked at guys uh, in the portal and, and certainly uh, had dialogue with them. And, and yeah, with, with Will Height. Um, and, I mean, it, I think it it adds to that notion when you think of the fact that their number situation is already pretty tight in terms of overall scholarships. And I know it gets creative these days with um, NIL and how you can kind of be, um, you know, creative with with getting guys on campus. But the fact that they're even bringing they had brought Will Hyde in for a visit and, and that he's considering Nebraska, I think, says a lot about what they see in that position and. I think it's another example of Nebraska looking a couple of years down the road because, again, for 2024, they're in pretty good shape with Ty Robinson and Nash Upmaker and Prince Will and uh, Cam Lenhart, and you can kind of go down the list. But uh, I think it's a move where you're looking for uh, development so someone like that's ready for 2025 and beyond. And uh, the, the traditional signing date's February 7th, I believe. So they still have a little bit of time uh, to continue to make their case. I know Texas was involved in some other schools as well, so he has some uh, decision-making still in front of him. But, uh, you know, that may be the last little bit of recruiting action Nebraska has before that traditional signing date. Um, I I do think it is reflective, though, of their opinion on what the defensive line is going to need in terms of bodies for 2025. Evan, uh, we'll wind down with basketball here about 45 seconds. Uh, buy it or sell in the Huskers and dance in here as we, as we talk here in uh, late January. I think I'm buying it. I, I, you know, a lot of people compare it to the team a few years ago that was snubbed and went to the NIT, and this group just has more quality wins with Purdue and, and Michigan State and, and Kansas State on the road. Indiana, I think, still moves the needle. So this group has some high-quality wins. I think the bar – if you're talking about the rest of the way, is win a couple of road games, doggone it. Find a way to <laughs> win at Illinois. Find a way to, to win at Maryland here uh, you know, this weekend. Like I think that's the bar. So I understand people are kind of trepidatious about Nebraska basketball, and, and certainly the wheels have fallen off before. But I think if that's your standard of getting to the big dance at this point, that's doable. So I'm going to buy it. Evan Bland, buying stock. I like it. Evan, great stuff, great work. Thanks for talking some Husker futures uh, when it comes to the recruiting game. And we'll check in with you next week, bud. Take care. Sounds great, guys. Thanks. There he is, Evan Bland. Find him on Twitter at Evan Bland, O-W-H. And Stephen checks in. Uh, we'll hear from Fred Hoiberg here next. But Stephen uh, writes in, can find us, Hale Varsity YouTube channel. I think kids will be looking at the development of the freshman quarterbacks coming in this year. Yeah. What, what does year one look like with Riola and companies? A fair question. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Some thoughts from Fred Hoiberg shortly. It's Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, 
Ken checks in in the stream, and we'll stay with football for two seconds here. He asks about Harburg. How about Harburg's chances for development? He's got all the tools. He just needs some remodeling. Imagine if the new quarterback coach just improves his game 20%. If Harburg's in the running and, and he has more experience than Raiola, I mean, you, you hit a grand slam with Glenn Thomas. And I'm not saying Harburg can't get there. You've just got a guy coming in who's more of a natural thrower than a, than a dual threat. And the offense that Nebraska wants to run is going to be, um, well, pass first, but have some escapability versus run first. There are a lot of things Harburg can do. Elijah, it'll, it, it would be interesting to, to find out or, or be able to go back and see if, if you would have had a developmental mindset when Harburg got here as a staff with a quarterback's coach or, or an offensive coordinator or two of them that Harburg went through that didn't set him back where he'd be. Because I think there's all sorts of athleticism and talent. Well- I just think the the number one thing that Heinrich Harburg needs in his development for next season in particular, there's there's things that he needs to work on. Um, just go play. The, be able to go play to and be practice. Able to, to go play, be able to go practice, and to have a solid run game to to back you up. Because I don't think Heinrich Harburg is in play to be the starting quarterback next year. If he surprises oh. you with his development and somehow gets that starting job, We're, I think it says more about Ryle and what he is coming in than it does about, about Harburg. So... I think realistically what you're developing Heinrich Harburg in, into is a guy that can be a solid backup quarterback, a guy that you can trust coming off the bench should it come down to it, and a guy that can get you some spot duties elsewhere on the field, whether it be as a, as a wing back, uh, an H back, a tight end, whatever you want to have him do. I think I think that's the role, the Taysom Hill-esque role, right. where you just need to be a good enough quarterback that if you have to come in, you can manage the offense, you can hand the football off, you can do what you have to do for a half. But go make a throw, a go make a play. How? And that's how, why that's why I think just the, the biggest yeah. thing for him is to to have a solid rushing attack. So whenever you you do have Heinrich Harburg throw the football around, it's third and four instead of third and twelve. Yeah, well, no, exactly, and and you know play to his strengths. And how much of it is him just being? A limited skill set versus inexperience. We and, and you know that's 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 it. And he's uh, he's a dude that can play some ball. And uh, let's let's get him some throws. Let's get him comfortable. Let's get him help. <laughs> to your point about the run game, and let's make third down manageable. How about that? Third and third and three. Do whatever the hell you want. Run it. Throw it. Sneak it. Well, with the guy with the dual threat ability of Harburg, it, it makes it a lot easier for him as a quarterback if he has to drop back and pass on third and three if the defense is worried about two different guys mm-hmm. running the football with both your running back and your quarterback. If the defense has to account for those guys on third and three, it's going to make the windows a little bit more wide open if you have to if you do end up dropping back to throw it. Yeah, play action. Let's get to Fred. And uh, Last night was big for Nebraska. Uh, protect home court. Keep the positive vibes a reality, and here is Fred. It was it was so important after two tough road games to uh, to come back and take care of uh, take care of the ball. And our guys stepped up to the challenge. You know, it was a, that Northwestern? That's a hard prep when you get back at three a.m. And, and have two days and have to play a one one o'clock game on uh, uh, on uh, over on the weekend. So you know, for us to find a way to bounce back and respond was huge. And now the challenge is, you know, we got to find a way to play with the same type of intensity, the same type of grit when we go on the road on Saturday against a really good team. It's hard to prepare for. Maryland does things that nobody else in our league does with their pressure and their uh, different defenses. Uh, but, you know, we'll have a couple of good days to prepare and put a game plan together, and hopefully we go out and execute. Well said, and maybe you get Juan back for Saturday. Maybe he goes against Fear the Turtle, and that's that spark, that energy you need. And uh, you, you figure out how to close one out for the first time since K-State. And, and Fred spoke on how close Juwan was to, to playing last night. Okay. He was close. He, uh, he thought about it, and um, you know, he just didn't have the confidence at this point to push off. He had a couple of good days of workouts, but you know, we really wanted to take – a smart long-term approach on this. We've got uh, uh, you know double-digit games left, and we didn't want him to go out there and aggravate it and affect him for the rest of the season. The reality too is Ohio State got Dutch ovened. Elijah, 
That's uh, one way to put it. They 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 got smoked. Rink was fan. <laughs> what did you say? The Dutch oven. Oh, it's 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 underrated. Um, Rink, Fred talks about that performance. He uh, obviously had one of those nights, and it was fun to see our guys really seek him out. And you know, as simple as it was, we really were just running a ball screen after a swing, throw the shake pass, get the ball to him in the post, and that's kind of what got him going. They uh, they were switching and, and wanted to uh, to try to get it into the paint. We uh, we missed our threes early and once we got the paint established that's what started opening up the uh the three-point shot and it, it was it was great to see rank he, he just he looked like a different person the last couple of days in practice he, he had more lift we do jump testing with our sports science department and his jump numbers were as high as they've been since december so we've been careful with him i know i've talked about that not getting him too many reps in practice just to try to keep him fresh for the game but at the same time we need to keep him sharp, and he's a guy that is a rhythm player. So, you know, it's really get shots and uh, get him in there, get him up and down a few times, and then and then get him off get him off his feet just with everything that he's been through. But, yeah, it was really fun to uh, to see our guys execute. Once he got it going and got a package for him, and, and I thought our guys executed beautifully, finding him and getting him the ball in, uh, in the right spots. So Fred uh, goes on to speak a little bit about Rank and where he stepped up this season. I just think he's he's you know very comfortable right now in finding his spots and not only what he did tonight scoring the ball but he's leading us in, in assists right now and that's pretty impressive when your five man is leading uh, le- leading the program in assists. Derek Walker did it for us last year, so it's an offense. If you got the right guy in it, and the thing Rink does that Derek didn't is is, is obviously his shooting ability. So, you know, having that guy, it's going to take the big away from the basket. So that's what opened up, I thought, some driving lanes. It opened up some uh, some cutting. And, uh, you know, Rink's, when he's knocking out shots like that, it makes it very difficult on the defense. Do you think Rink's got a solid argument, plenty of basketball left to be, to be all Big Ten? Not over Edie for sure, but beyond honorable mention, like, can he get to third team? I mean, statistically, he's got for sure an argument. And I know 34 and 10 is one night. He's had some some tough nights, but he's also had double-digit nights. I mean, his versatility is a real pain in the backside for about everyone trying to defend him. Well, I, I think what makes him such a problem and what, what might get him to not is the way he is the modern big man. And you've seen how it's changed in the NBA. I mean, it really started with Jokic, not to, to put my Nuggets bias to the side, but with how he kind of has started the change in the NBA. Look back to Steph Curry and the, the three-point revolution. Right. You started seeing a, a big man resurgence in the NBA, not with this Jokic, but you have Joel Embiid who does it in his own way, but they run the offense through him in Philadelphia. Uh, the, the kid down in, uh, in Houston with the Rockets, I can't remember his name, starts with an S. Um, but he's kind of built from the same vein as Jokic, where he's a he's but a passer Euro- from European the five. influence, where it's it's ball handling by the big guy, ball handling by the big guy, and, and point forward. And I guess you could go back as far as LeBron James with that, and the 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 issues that he caused for defense is being that point forward, bringing the ball up at either a four or a five spot. Mm-hmm. It's the way the modern NBA is moving, and you've seen that that big men that are kind of stuck in the old big man of the, of the Big Ten have struggled to defend against that, and it's been, I mean, really everyone, but. Kalkbrenner this year that's really struggled to to defend against rink mass and Kalkbrenner seven foot two he's going to give a lot of people issues with his lateral movement to, to give Creighton and Kalkbrenner a little bit of credit um, but other than that like you've had games where rink has not had the shooting touch but that's been the only real game where I think he's been truly shut down offensively if you if you got, try to get what I'm saying whenever you factor in the passing and how he factors into the offense as a whole rink can affect the offense without scoring it it didn't go well against Rutgers but that was more from a shooting perspective sure, and getting the looks. He, he wasn't bad from a, an offense as a whole with, with how he distributed the ball. You know what I'm saying? No, he, he had some turnovers, but the assists were, were there, to your point. Yeah. Uh, Wagner is, is kind of, I go back to beeline in Michigan with uh, that giant German uh, high posting and, and stepping out and pick and pop for threes. Nebraska has that. I mean, think about, think about a, a, a ball game where you've got – Tomanaga that's on, Wiltshire that's on, and and Rink. I mean, all three from, from downtown. Last thought here from Fred. He talked a little bit here about Sam's defensive performance. 
Thornton, he, he does such a good job using his body. He's a big, strong, physical guard, and he really does a good job creating space with his physicality. And I thought Sam did a better job than we were doing early as far as staying down and making him shoot uh, uh, through the goalposts. You know, obviously Sam didn't have great length, but he uh, did a good job keeping his chest, uh, staying chest to chest. And, uh, you know, once we got it going, I think CJ, the other thing, when they cut it to three, CJ hit back-to-back threes, which were which were enormous uh, to build that thing back up to nine. <clears throat> and then I thought our guys did a good job executing. You know, the other guy I want to point out, Jamarcus, he didn't have a great shooting night, but he goes out there with six assists and one turnover. So that, that's huge. That's growth. We did a better job playing off two feet, playing with two hands, two feet. When we did play with one, you know, it wasn't very pretty. But 19 assists to six turnovers, that was another big factor today after the last couple of games turning it over too much. Good work. Uh, second to last thought, here is Fred on the team performance. I thought it started in the first half. I thought we did a good job first to the floor, and we got a couple 50-50 balls, and we talked about it in the locker room. The more physical team is going to have a great chance to win this game. And, that, and Chris Holtman does a great job. Those guys are physical. They guard. They, uh, they're tough. And, you know, we talked about they had uh, Rutgers-like physicality, and obviously we got dominated from a physical standpoint in that game. And, you know, we talked about it against Northwestern. You, you win the glass, you're going to have a great chance to win. And we said the same thing tonight. I think it was 35 to 28 at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, when you do that, you're going to give yourself a really good chance. And guys got it going. And I told them in the locker room, the beauty of this team is it's not going to be the same guy every night. Kese uh, didn't have it going tonight. CJ came off and he was phenomenal. Sam, I thought, gave us really good minutes. I thought the game flipped with uh, Sam's energy off the bench. Eli gave us great minutes off the bench as well, and he was a big part of those runs that we made out there in the floor. And I think Sam was a plus 23, uh, you know, for us as well. So, you know, guys just uh, continued to go out there, and I thought it was a full team effort. And Josiah, just, you know, the energy he provides for our team. Uh, he gave the post-game speech to, after the game, and I had to give him the hook to get him off of there. But, you know, he, uh, you know listen, it, it was it was a fun game and here's the other thing our guys I thought did a great job responding to adversity we get down nine in that first half there was no panic everybody kept their poise and then we went out and finally started getting stops they they hit shots early I think their first four or five and then we uh you know forced them to miss a few and that's what got us out in transition and that's what got us confident good one for Nebraska against a talented Ohio State team Hail Varsity continues we're powered by Cornhead Lager and now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back into it at Hale Varsity Radio, and we say hi to Dr. Brandon Seifert, Nebraska Orthopedic Center. A jock doc Wednesday. It is down to the final four in the NFL. Dr. Brandon, 49ers have been incredible. Uh, Debo Samuel, no practice as we talk today. But at least, hey, it's not a fractured shoulder. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the ailments Debo's dealing with and just how you go from sore sh- shoulder to fractured shoulder. Yeah, absolutely. So you look at him, and again, we start speculating a bit here on what kind of injuries could be involved with this. So they did some scans. I'm assuming part of that was an MRI found out that he didn't have a fracture. I think they were concerned about potentially a fracture of the socket, which is called the glenoid. Uh, But, you know, as we review anatomy in the shoulder, we've talked about these before. Shoulder, of course, is a ball and socket joint. On the socket side, there's a ring structure that sits around that called the labrum. We discussed that before. So suspicions are here with this type of injury, kind of looking at his mechanism, probably had an event here where that ball portion probably slid up on top of that labrum, maybe stretched a little bit of the labrum, maybe some tiny tearing in that labrum. You know, that would be probably the most common thing we would see here. Obviously, with the contact and the move that he had, there's even an opportunity here for whether it be like a rotator cuff injury, that's the muscular portions that surround the shoulder, versus even like maybe a biceps tendon injury, the biceps tendon, one of them attaches inside the shoulder joint. Those would be kind of the three main things we'd be talking about if we're dealing more with the soft tissue injury, which in this scenario is pretty pretty common. And the last thing there, obviously, they're concerned about, you know, shoulder fracture, there is a chance here that that ball portion really kind of slammed hard into the socket of the glenoid. You can also get a thing called a a chondral contusion, which is essentially kind of a deep bone bruise, kind of a bruise in the bone underneath the cartilage. 
that also is a, a possibility here. Again, we're, we're speculating some with these things. Well, I look at his injury history, and you know the Niners are just a totally different team without him, Doctor Brandon. And he missed two games this year and the bye week with that left shoulder. He had a microfracture. Uh, tell us a little bit about the microfracture and how maybe that still is lingering, uh, perhaps here with this discomfort. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, those things do take a while to heal. Anytime you get that, basically the bone that's kind of underneath the cartilage, anytime that gets really irritated, whether it be you know from a procedure or from an injury of sorts. Um, it takes a long time for that kind of bony portion to essentially recover. You just kind of have this deep, achy bone pain for a while. Obviously, you keep having trauma to the area, and that just further kind of flares that up, which is probably a combo of those two things for him. You know, it's not uncommon to have you know, these microfracture procedures, procedures where that you know bone under the cartilage gets irritated, and these can be really sore for even in young people that heal these fast for four, six, eight months. And so we're probably still in that scenario with him. Dr. Brandon Seifert with us here at Jock Talk Wednesday on Hale Varsity Radio. And Dr. Brandon, what I'm trying to do right now is sift through some of the reports we're getting from the 49ers. A team source told Adam Schefter they consider Debo Samuel a 50-50 chance to play. And I'm trying to figure out if that's gamesmanship. What are the dangers, obviously not knowing exactly what this shoulder injury is, of Debo giving it a go on Sunday? We know there's some pain management strategies that are in use in the NFL, especially in a week like conference championship week. So I want to get your thoughts on what the danger of, of him playing could be on Sunday because I see that 50-50 comment. And if it's just a pain thing you would think that Debo would try to give it a go. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, there's always kind of two big factors there when you're looking at what we call kind of an aggressive return when you haven't fully recovered, but have you recovered enough to play? You know, the main thing is full strength, full motion is kind of a rule that we always have. If you can get to that point or at least close to it, you can protect yourself. And that's the first question. Can you protect yourself? Do you have enough motion, muscular function, neuromuscular coordination to basically protect yourself on the field. That's goal number one. And then you move into goal number two, which is, okay, structurally, do you have enough of that kind of injured structure left to prevent, you know, further image to the, or excuse me, further damage to the area? Let's say, for example, he had this event happen where maybe this was an instability event where that shoulder popped out. We don't know that, but let's say that's what it is. So in that scenario, you already popped out once. He gets strength, all that kind of stuff back, but he has some structural trauma to the area. Is there still enough of that, you know, kind of labrum left? Is it still a good enough position that that's going to give him good stability? Or did he really, you know, beat this thing up enough where now he's really at a very high risk of having another kind of instability event occur? And so those would be kind of some of the questions I'll have to answer, which, you know, one, based on just basically his, his function overall clinical exam, and then obviously number two, you start to take some of the structural imaging that you see to make a call on whether or not he'll be Dr. Brandon Seifert's with us, Nebraska Orthopedic Center at Jock Talk Wednesday. Debo Samuel, our topic, the Niners would love to have him against Detroit. Dr. Brandon, uh, when we talk pain tolerance, uh, how how does this compare to other parts of the body? How how problematic is the pain management with the shoulder? Yeah, the good news is about that. It's it's always harder, I think, managing kind of pain tolerance, pain issues in a really kind of significant weight-bearing area. You know, for example, you know, ankle, hip, knee, those kind of areas. Or if you have kind of that midfoot sprain we've talked about in the foot, those areas I think are harder to kind of manage pain from. Um, Dealing with the shoulder, obviously, it's not a weight-bearing area, so I think it's a little easier. You can be a little bit more aggressive in that area in terms of you know letting them go back and play. So I think from his perspective might be a little bit easier in this area to manage that. How are they going to manage? Do you numb it? Do you give him the needle? Do you take some Advil? <laughs> I mean, how do, we, uh, how do we play here? Yeah, exactly. So that's always that big question. Yeah, do you bring out the needle and go? I would think in this scenario probably not the best way to go. Um, I would probably say it wouldn't lean towards that. But this is probably an area where you could think about a strong anti-inflammatory. Um, you know, I don't know what the most recent kind of league policy is on, you know, some of those really high-level anti-inflammatories, like, for example, a Toradol shot or like a Cataflam type, really high-level anti-inflammatory that can be kind of tough in your system. But that might be an option. I, again, I don't know what the rules are on that. We tend not to use those just because it's really hard on your kidneys and then you take somebody playing sports and they're already dehydrated. 
kind of a tough scenario to be in. So that's something to probably think about. Injection-wise, I'd probably say no. Icing is obviously there, but it really just kind of boils down to try to minimize the amount of hits you're taking to that area uh, and just kind of getting through it. Dr. Dr. Brand, I want to get your thoughts. Do you have any personal experience here? I feel bad for the team doctors that should they have to tell Debo he can't play on Sunday, just what that experience is going to be like. I want to get your, your personal history. Have you ever had to tell an athlete that they can't play despite how much they want to go play? Yeah, it's hard. You know, Usually after you have a, a long conversation with them about kind of risk benefits, I would say 99% of the time, you get them, they're on the same page where you're at. Um, where we do struggle some are, are like concussions. That would be the one area which obviously there's there's no budging on that. You're, you're just not going to go back and play. But I do have some that will fight us some. Like, and I feel fine even though they failed tests and they're obviously not going back out. That'd be the time you see me hanging onto their helmet, standing on the sidelines, and them trying to get it back from me. Um, outside of that, you know, we've had a couple, but usually if it boils down to this is an injury that not the most drastic thing in the world if you go back and play, but maybe not advisable. Uh, then we'll just have a risk-benefit discussion, and you know, parents may come in or agent may come in, and we'll talk about, hey, look, here's what can happen. If it's me, I wouldn't recommend it. However, it's not black and white that you couldn't play. And so that's where we'll make just kind of a decision together and say, hey, if you want to take this risk, you can do it. Well, Dr. Brandon, something tells me if it comes down to it, Debo will be playing on Sunday. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think you're probably correct there. Dr. Brandon Seifert with us, Nebraska Orthopedic Center at Jock Doc Wednesday. Debo Samuel, our topic. Dr. Brandon, take care. We'll check in again next week. Okay, fellas. Hey, you guys take care. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time, it's Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Logger, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Podcast, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, where you can download and subscribe to Hale Varsity. Uh, get us on the YouTube channel or the different Twitter slash X platforms, uh, KFOR, ESPN Omaha, and uh, yes, the Hale Varsity Radio Twitter feed at HVarsity Radio. So Jim Harbaugh, per Adam Schefter, is off to the Chargers. This uh, coming down here, what did you say, about five minutes ago, Elijah? Mm-hmm. About five, yeah. So it is Jimbo off to the Chargers. He played ball there. He coached there. He uh, likes San Diego. Someone needs to break it to Harbaugh that they are in L.A. now. But th- that doesn't matter. So Michigan has an opening. Question here is, does Jesse Minter come with him as defensive coordinator to – the uh, the AFC West. If you're Ernest Hausman, yeah, you got a ring. If you're Ernest Hausman, he did a hell of a job playing for Michigan last year as a backup linebacker. But you've had your position coach get blown out. You've had your defensive coordinator presumably or possibly leaving to go with your head coach off to the NFL. And I know Nebraska fans miss having Ernest because he was a talented ball player. What a weird roundabout story that would be if Ernest comes back to Nebraska. Well, and, and I don't know what the ab- availability or the desire would be. Nor do I. I mean, Nor do I. It's, it's fun he's, to talk about, he's, though. He's up for starting spot. You know what I mean? So Morris presumably gets the Michigan job. Mm. Does Brian Kelly make his move? Is he a guy that maybe flirts with that i know he just got to lsu but he's a michigan and he's originally from boston college but got his cut his teeth in michigan less miles for sure as hell wants the job but less you've been retired for a while give me ed o you think <laughs> no i don't think so i think it'd be awesome though i think ed would be hilarious I want ed o in the for a time. year yeah i want <laughs> i want ed o coach go tigers go wolverines well you know a coach out there always looking for a ready-made roster, you know, wants to maybe turn his public image around just a little bit. Does Urban Meyer? Go Michigan? Th- go throw his name in the ring. Oh, man. Does Buckeye, Bo, does, Buckeye fans would Does riot. Bo like retirement? Bo? Pelini. Oh, that would be a... I'm not sure they do that. No, he's no Ohio State guy. They're, they're going to go in-house. 
No, he's an Ohio I, State guy. I, I am pretty confident in saying Michigan's going to go in-house for this hire. Yeah, they'll go with their uh, their running backs. Well, coach. Also, who else across the country wants to walk into the potential future punishment that could come down from Michigan? We well, mm-hmm. don't know if that's going to happen or not. Maybe the writing is on the wall with Harbaugh leaving him, thinking there's going to be some future punishment coming down. Who knows? Harbaugh gets his national title now. He's off to the NFL. We kind of saw it coming. Where does Michigan go now? Reigns to be seen. I'll be curious to follow that over the next couple of days, but I also have a feeling they ha- they'll have somebody set up in, in order, in, in relatively short order. I, would, you, would you say by the end of the week we have a feeling Michigan's going to have their next man announced? So Sharon Moore, the favorite to replace Jim. Other names, because his names are always out there. Lance Leipold, Chris Kleiman, Dave Clawson, Wake Forest. Hmm. Pete Thamel. Matt Rule and Luke Fickle have been considered amid past Harbaugh flirtations no way. with the NFL. All I know is I think this will be done in a relatively short order. Yep. Talk to you tomorrow at 4. Thanks.